You're listening to Key Conversations for Leaders. This is episode number one. If you look at the major successes and the massive setbacks you've had in your career, they can all be traced back to conversations you either had or didn't have. In fact, your future and that of your company is determined by the quality of conversations you have with your team, your customers, and yourself. This podcast will teach you how to be a better leader through better conversations. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Key Conversations for Leaders. My name is John Ryan, and I want to start by going over a couple points to help you get an idea of what this podcast is about and then jump into some content. So let's start by talking about who this is for, why you should listen, and what you can expect. So really quickly, let me just tell you who this is for so that you know that you're in the right place or not. So this podcast is for leaders throughout the organization who want to step up their game. This is for executives, for entrepreneurs, small business owners, and for anyone who wants to get more results and less resistance from yourself and others. Now, even if you don't have direct reports, if you don't have a team, you can still be and step up as a leader. Leadership is not about an org chart. It's about mindset, communication, accountability, and responsibility. In the end, It's about empowering others to achieve a common goal. And that's the focus for this podcast. How do you step up as a leader? How do you pull the best out of the people that you work with? And how do you lead by example? So this is obviously for leaders at every level. Anyone and everyone who recognizes the importance of their communication and creating success. Because that's why you're here, right? That's why you're here listening and why you should listen is because You want to grow. You want to lead. You want to get more results. And because of that, I know you're ready to have a serious conversation about the most overlooked and underutilized skill in leadership, having effective conversations. The skill is what allows you to build leaders on your team, how to coach them through obstacles and teach them to cultivate creative solutions. The skill is the difference that makes the difference in leadership. And it's something you've been doing your whole life. And because it's so innate, it seems like it's so easy. It's easy to take it for granted and forget that it is a skill that needs to be honed and developed in order for you to reach your goals for yourself and your team. Everyone can talk, but how many of us can have a truly effective conversation when it matters the most? How many of us simply wing it and hope for the best? or postpone important conversations hoping that the problem will magically solve itself? How often do we offer a one-size-fits-all approach with our communication, forgetting the power of adapting our message to best fit the situation? Now, some might argue that conversations should be authentic or impromptu, and that can work. But when you are faced with a key conversation, one whose outcome can change the course of your life or someone else's, It's not the time to show up unprepared and cross your fingers and hope that it goes your way. In your business life, everything you have now or will have in the future comes down to one thing, how effective you are in communicating your ideas in a way that moves people to come together to follow your vision. We don't exist in a vacuum. Leaders cannot lead without people willing to follow. Looking all the way back to the start of your career, somewhere along the line, you had to convince someone to believe in you. You had to communicate the value of your ideas so that someone decided to take a chance on you and hire you, invest in your idea, or join your team, even though it might have been a long shot. It all came down to a conversation. And now that we've talked about who this is for and really why you should listen, let's talk about what to expect. One of the key elements of a conversation is setting the frame. As I like to say, framing is everything. So I want to get clear on what you can expect from this podcast. From a scheduling perspective, at this point, I wish I could say that the Key Conversations for Leaders podcast is going to come out every Tuesday, but that might be a little bit ambitious. Due to my speaking schedule and working with my one-on-one coaching clients, most likely it's going to come out in clusters with groups of podcasts being released all at once. So be sure to subscribe to have the episodes automatically downloaded to your phone or computer, however you like to listen to the podcast. And we're not going to be doing a lot of fluff here. 
I don't want to waste your time nor mine. I'd rather focus on giving you solid content. So we're going to be as efficient as possible in delivering the content you're looking for. The length of the show is going to depend. Sometimes we're going to be doing long format interviews, and other times I might share with you some content-heavy shows that could be a little bit shorter. Sometimes shorter, sometimes longer, depending on what we're covering that day. So we'll get in. We'll talk with experts in a variety of industries. I'll share with you some content. We'll talk about how you can apply that information, and then you can get right back to it, applying what we've discussed. And that's the idea. Content, then application. Because it's not what we know, it's what we do with what we know that matters. So that's it for our logistics. Let's go ahead and jump into some content, and we'll wrap up our discussion with some things we can do right away to apply this information. And I think the best place to start in talking about enhancing our leadership skills and This concept really applies to just about any profession in any role, or what I think of as the two components of success, which are mindset and mechanics. Mindset is, of course, your beliefs, your attitude, your emotional state. It's everything you do on the inside that comes out in the mechanics. Mechanics is really the what. It's the process. It's the steps. It's what you say and what you do. And these both come together with the idea that we've all heard, which is, it's not just what you say, which is the mechanics, but how you say it, which comes from your mindset. Both are important. If you have a great mindset, a great attitude, but don't know what to do, well, that's a problem. If you know what to do, but you're not communicating it effectively because of negative emotions, or you know what to do, but you're not doing it because of the fear that's inside, well, those are problems too. So we need both. And we're going to cover a little bit of both today, mindset and mechanics. But I want to start by talking about mindset first, because to me, this is where it all begins. Because I could share with you the best way to lead your team. I could give you the best way to negotiate, the best way to get feedback. But if your mindset isn't dialed in, you may not even do anything with it. Or it won't produce the desired result because you're not congruent. So I want to focus on developing an empowering mindset. In reality, having the right mindset is more than half the battle. It's what wins the war. Think about it. You probably had an experience yourself, or maybe you've come across someone who didn't necessarily say the right things in the right way, and they weren't completely polished, but they were still able to get their point across. They were still able to motivate their team or get the sale because their mindset was fully in alignment and they fully believed what it was that they were saying. And what you'll find is the right words aren't as important as the right beliefs and the right attitude. Now, are words important? Absolutely. But as we said, it's not just what you say, but how you say it that matters. Imagine, if you will, the classic example of an iceberg. You've probably seen this visual before where there's just a little bit of the iceberg above the water that's visible above the surface, and there's this huge part of the iceberg under the surface. So let's say 90% of it is below the surface. And I've seen it most often used as a metaphor for the conscious mind and the unconscious or the subconscious mind. So our conscious mind in that situation is the 10% that's above the water that we see And the unconscious mind is the 90% portion of really who we are. So instead of thinking about it in relation to the conscious and unconscious mind, instead, I'd like you to think of it as a metaphor for your business. The top of the iceberg, the 10%, this is the mechanics. This is the technical side of what you do, your sales and your marketing, for example. The bottom 90% is your mindset. It's your beliefs, your attitudes, and your emotions. So the iceberg represents the relationship between mindset and mechanics. 10% of your results come from the mechanics. 90% of your results come from managing your mindset, which is the foundation of everything that you do. Just like language, it's not what you do, it's how you do it, and that really comes from your mindset. And I have to admit, I used to be resistant to this idea. Early on in my career, you know, I thought it was just about the actions. If I could get the right script, 
the right wording, I thought everything would just work out. And don't get me wrong, scripting is critical. The right script, the right languaging can make all the difference when it's combined with the right mentality. So I remember back when I was just starting out in my business, and like many entrepreneurs just starting out, I needed customers. So I hit the phones. And I thought, very naively in retrospect, that all I had to do was to call someone up, say the right script, and bingo, I get a sale. Well, if you've done phone sales before, that you know it doesn't quite work out that way. I was calling people, and I wasn't getting results, so I hired a sales coach. I shared with him my script, and he thought it looked good. That felt pretty good. And what he said was, have patience. It just takes time. It's all about the dials. Smile and dial, as they say. He said, you just have to figure out your numbers. For example, if you call 100 people, you get 10 appointments, you might get one sale. You figure out your numbers, and then you just keep on dialing to get the income that you want. But here was my real problem. I was absolutely terrified of calling people that I didn't know. I didn't know what problem I was going to really solve for them. And as a result, I had no clue what my real offer was. Well, do you think those phone calls went well? It was horrible. I made over a thousand phone calls and I got zero appointments and zero sales. I called my coach who helped me with the script and I was like, what am I doing wrong here? And his advice was, keep dialing. At that point, I was like, no way. This makes no sense to me because even if I could get a sale for every two or 3,000 calls that I made, that's a horrible closing ratio. And there's no way that I can make a living doing it that way. Needless to say, I didn't work with that coach long. So I went back to the drawing board and I started talking to people who were getting great results. And to be honest, they were saying very similar things to what I was saying. And I don't know if any of them were aware of this, but what I began to notice was the people who were amazing closers, who were getting appointments and were getting sales, they really had two things. They believed in their product or service, and they believed in themselves. In other words, they were completely congruent in what they were offering. As leaders, as managers, as business owners, we might not be hitting the phones prospecting for business, but we're in sales too. We're selling our ideas. The way we communicate the values of those ideas and create the buy-in that we're looking for begins with our mindset. And the amazing thing is that once you get your mindset where you want it to be, once you get in that right state, then everything else just seems to come together. You know what to say, how to say it, when to say it, and you're able to be in the flow. And when you're in that space of being in the flow, that's when it becomes easy. So the question is, how do you get yourself into that state? And if you get knocked out of that state, how do you get back into it? You see, when things are going well, It's easy to be positive. It's easy to be positive and to give positive feedback and encouragement. But when things aren't going well, that's when it really matters. When the pressure's on, that's when our mindset and our congruency really gets tested. Do we rise to the occasion and handle what needs to be handled? Or do we hide and hope it goes away? Well, of course, we like to think that we rise to the occasion. But what we think we do and what we actually do are not always the same thing. In fact, our own self-perception causes us to pay more attention to the things that we do well than the things that we don't do so well. It actually has a name for it. It comes from psychology, and it's called illusory superiority. It's the idea that most people think that they are above average. It's the illusion of superiority. And It's an illusion, of course, because most people can't be above average because that's what an average is. It's the average of everybody. But as individuals, we tend to think that we're above average in our intelligence, in our driving, in our performance at our jobs as leaders. And to be honest, that's not a bad thing. This is actually useful for having a positive mindset. If we focused only on the bad things, which of course some people do, that takes you into a downward spiral. We don't want to make a mistake and look bad. And and then if every time I do something, it doesn't work out, then the only way to avoid that 
is to actually not do anything. So we don't want to go down that route either. Having a positive sense of self, even if it's inflated, is way better than having a negative sense of self. The challenge with illusory superiority is that we aren't always able to see our true performance. We're not able to see the true impact of our communication on others. But if we don't actively look for where we're not performing, where we're not able to get results, then we can't address those issues. So we want to take inventory. We want to take stock of where we're getting results and where we might not be getting the results we actually want. So we want to ask ourselves, what is an area of my business that I haven't been focusing on? Is there a project that I've been avoiding checking in on because I really don't want to know what's happening? Is there behavior that I need to address? Is there feedback that I need to deliver? What's one thing? So I want you to think about what's one thing that you can look at today that you've been putting off. Then once you identify that one thing that you want to focus on, then get yourself in the right mindset to handle it. Think about the consequences of putting it off any further. What will it cost you if you don't handle it today? Create some urgency. How much better will it be handling this now rather than waiting another week, another month, or more? Then have the conversation. Take the action. Do what you need to do in order to put energy into solving that problem. This is Newton's first law of motion. An object in motion tends to stay in motion, and an object at rest tends to stay at rest. And that's really why we get stuck. We have a tendency to like sameness in many cases. Sameness creates familiarity, which creates a feeling of safety and security. But it's really not. It's an illusion. If we stay in the same place, if we don't move, nothing happens and everything falls apart. The only security is flexibility, which is movement. To be responsive and to keep changing, to keep adapting, and really keep growing and keep going. So once you get the ball rolling, it's much easier to keep that momentum. It's breaking that barrier between being stuck and getting it moving, and that takes action. So identify the action that you want to take, identify the conversation that you want to have, and do something to create momentum. That will get the ball rolling. And let's talk about that. How do you get the ball rolling? Let's shift our focus from mindset to mechanics. Now, obviously, I love conversations. I think conversations are perhaps one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful tools on the planet. So I have a lot of thoughts that I can share about how to have a really good, effective, results-driven conversation. And those are some of the ideas that we're going to be exploring on this show. And I want to start by giving you a simple framework to have a conversation, just about any conversation that you want. So I want to share with you what I refer to as the seven C's of a conversation. We're going to go over these seven elements of a conversation, and I'm going to give you an example of how it can be used, and then we're going to focus on what you can do today to start using this information. First, you might be saying to yourself, you know, I already know how to have a conversation. In fact, I've been having conversations my whole life. I'm great at conversations, and you probably are, and that's awesome, but we all can improve. We can all get better. And remember the idea of illusory superiority. I imagine that most people think that they're above average at having conversations too. And we don't want to fall into that trap. We don't just want to think that we're effective at having conversations. We actually want to be effective. So let's have a conversation about having a conversation. In fact, we're already in the middle of that conversation right now. So let's just keep going. To give us a place to apply the seven C's of a conversation, let's use an example to show how each of these pieces can be used. So let's imagine that you're leading a team and there's one person on your team who isn't giving you updates as frequently as you need. You ask for a weekly report, a summary of their progress on a project, and they're the only one who doesn't turn them in. Now, are there a million ways to approach this? Of course. But let's say that you've already let them know that you would like the weekly updates, but they're still not doing it. 
So let's go through the seven C's and we'll talk about how we can apply each one as we go. Number one, the first C is to create the frame. This is getting the conversation started and creating the opening frame. How are you going to frame the conversation to make sure that they really hear your message? In general, what you do for this really depends on a lot of things. You gotta think about, you know, what's the topic? Have you talked about this issue before? Is this something new? How urgent is it? How important is it? So creating the frame when done properly, it does a couple of things. Number one, of course, it sets the tone. Is this going to be a good meeting or more of a difficult meeting? And number two, it sets the frame or perspective that allows the person you're talking with to really get your message. And thirdly, it can also pre-handle or pre-frame objections if you think there could be any objections during your discussion or that could show up afterwards. And what I mean by that is sometimes the employee or the person on your team that you're talking with, they'll bring up an objection during the conversation, but other times they'll agree in the meeting, but then they have an objection later on as to why they didn't do what they agreed to do, what they were supposed to do. At that point, it could be more of an excuse. And this part right here, the pre-handling or pre-framing, is really why this step, creating the frame, is so important. It can speed up the conversation, and it can make your message more acceptable to the person you're talking to, and also can accelerate your results. Think about the alternative. Let's say that you don't do any of this, which is a possibility. You could bypass the seven C's that we're talking about here and just jump right on in, and it might look like this. You say to the employee or the team member, hey, you're the only one who hasn't gotten me their update on the project. What's going on? And that approach might not be a bad one. It can be useful. That depends on your relationship, the urgency, the stakes involved, and even how far down the line you are in correcting this behavior. Typically, as the problem persists, intensity goes up to make sure that they hear you and they're aware of the upcoming consequences of non-compliance. So yes, that's fine. That can work but it doesn't handle the objections. Because what's the other person gonna say if you say that to them? Well, they just got attacked, and justly so, but now they're probably going to be on the defensive. They might say, yes, I meant to have it for you yesterday, but insert emergency here. Now you have to decide, is that emergency sufficient to warrant a delay? But at this point, we're off course. Our goal isn't to find out why they didn't get it to us. We want to make sure that they get it to us and that they continue to update us as previously agreed upon. So if our outcome is to get them to deliver the report, then one thing you can do is to pre-handle or pre-frame the possible objections that could come up before they come up. Now, there's a limit to this too. Let's say that you brainstorm and you come up with 15 possible objections. You're not going to address all 15 before getting into the discussion. You're gonna pick maybe one to three max and address those when you're creating the frame. Now let's say that you identify three major possible objections. Number one, they're busy putting out fires. Number two, they might not have all the information related to the update. Number three, their kid is sick. Now, whether these are legitimate objections or not is irrelevant. Whether these are legitimate objections or not is irrelevant. These are still the potential reasons that they might give for not turning in the report. So instead of letting them give you the reasons, you address them first, thereby taking away those excuses. It might sound like this. Hey. Thanks for taking the time to meet with me. And I wanted to check in with you on the project you've been working on. But first, how's your kid? Are they feeling any better? Listen, I know you've got a lot going on right now. And I know that your kid is sick. You've been dealing with that. And you've had a lot of fires to put out recently. And I want to talk with you about the project updates. Okay, let's pause right there. So that's a potential opening frame. 
We've created the frame and let's break that down. Let's look at the first sentence. Hey, thanks for taking the time to meet with me. Now, this is an appreciation frame. And to be fair, they're your employee. So they theoretically have to meet with you. It's part of their job. So you might be thinking, why would I thank them for meeting with me? It's not about that. You're setting a positive frame for the meeting. You're setting up an atmosphere of openness and receptiveness. As Stephen Covey would say, you're making a deposit in the relationship bank account. You're investing in the relationship. Of course, you don't have to say that. You could talk about the great job that they're doing or some success that they just had. You're finding something to show appreciation for. And of course, there's a limit for this too. At the other extreme, you don't want to be of too much praise because you're about to point out to them where they're dropping the ball. So set the tone of appreciation and acknowledgement and in a kind of a balanced way. Then let's look at the next part. We then go on to say, I wanted to check in with you on the project you've been working on, but first, how is your kid? Are they feeling any better? So you've set the agenda. I want to check in with you on the project that you're working on. But before you dive in, you take a detour and you get to be a human being for a moment and you check on their kid. How are they doing? Are they feeling better? This shows you that you're paying attention to them and that you care. You're also setting up the preframe about possible objections because that's the next part. Now, here's the preframes. Listen, I know you've got a lot going on right now. I know that your kid is sick and you've been dealing with that. And you've had a lot of fires to put out recently. And I want to talk about the project updates. The main preframe you're using here is, I know you're busy. Then you give specific examples dealing with how you know that they're busy. Your kid is sick. And also a lot of unexpected things have come up at work. So what does this do for us? And here's the beauty of it. Now that you've identified it, they can't bring it up later on as the reason that they didn't get it done because you've already acknowledged it. It takes away those objections. And even if they do bring it up when it's their turn to talk, you can fall back on the idea that you've already said that. It's already been established. So once you've set up the preframes, then you're transitioning to the outcome of the meeting. You're setting up the next part of the conversation. Ideally, you want each part of the conversation to lead smoothly to the next. So that's a little bit of what can be done with creating the frame. You establish a positive tone, and ideally, you pre-address the objections that would come up down the line, and in doing so, you take away their power because they've already been acknowledged. Then you're on to the second C, which is context. We ended part one. We created the frame by establishing the outcome of the conversation. And we said, I want to talk to you about the project updates. The second C is context. This is describing, obviously, the context, the situation. So here's what we can say for context. I know we've talked about this before, and you said you would get me an update every week. Obviously, this hasn't happened. So what we're doing is we're saying the context for the situation is this is something we've already discussed. You told me you do something and you didn't do it. We're talking about the facts. This is the situation that we're in. Now, while we're laying out the context, we're also laying the groundwork for the third C, which is conflict. In fact, you can actually hear the conflict or the tension in the context. We said, we talked about this before, and you said you were going to give an update, and you didn't. That would be enough to establish the conflict too. If you ended there, that would be totally fine. You could cover both context and conflict at the exact same time. And many people do that, and I do that as well sometimes. But to take it further, though, we establish how this is causing a problem for you as the leader. We could say, The problem is that I can't keep the client informed and I don't know where we stand. In other words, I'm not able to do my job if you don't do yours. Again, we could have stopped before with just the context. You said you'd do something and you didn't. Instead, what we're doing is we're stacking on a discussion of impact. 
not only are they not doing their job, they're preventing us from doing ours. Now we have conflict. Now we're communicating the pressure. And one of the reasons we do this is not just to communicate the importance of the problem, which is its main function, but to also begin to get the employee to start to think about how their actions and or inactions are affecting other parts of the system. We're all in the same canoe and we have to hold ourselves accountable or the whole thing falls apart. And that's a much bigger lesson than, hey, make sure you turn your reports in on time. So we've handled the objections, we established the context and the conflict, now it's time for the next part. So before we look at this piece, if you were listening carefully when I was creating the frame, you noticed that I only addressed two of the possible objections. I said, I know your kid is sick and uh, you've been putting out a lot of fires lately. We didn't address the possible reason they haven't completed the report was because they may not have all the information required to complete the update. That could have been handled in part one too, creating the frame. Instead, that might have been a little bit too much and it felt to me a little bit out of place. So what we can do is bring that objection in here as part of the content. So this is the fourth C, content. At this point, you're sharing any other information or frame needed for the other person to understand what you're saying. So in this example, we do two things. We address that third objection by saying, maybe part of the issue is that you're still waiting on information and you wanted to wait until you get all the information to give a full update. And then we use that as the basis to let them know that even if that's true, that you don't have all the information, even if that's true, that we still let them know that a partial update is way better than no update at all. That's the content. That's the part that maybe they were missing. After all, an update about not having all the information needed for the update is also important for you to know as the leader. You don't just wanna know when things are good, you also wanna know when there's a problem. For this content, we're saying, hey, you might not have all the information, I don't care. That's not a good excuse because even if you don't have all the information, I want to know that too. At this point, we've addressed all three objections we identified before. So we set up the context and the conflict. We let them know our position that a partial update is better than no update at all. And now we want to hear from them. So we do the fifth C, which is call to action. We say, so I want to find out what do you need? What can I do for you to help you make sure that I have the update every week like we talked about? Now we're turning it over to them with a support frame. Help me to help you. How can I help you? What's preventing you from getting this done and how can I make sure that we can overcome this so that we don't have this problem again? Once we've done that, then we're on to the sixth C, which is check-in. Now what you're doing is you're turning the floor over to the employee and you're hearing what they have to say. This is important. Everything up to this point has been coming from you. You framed everything you can. You've established the boundaries of the conversation. And now it's your turn to listen. What are they saying? Do they acknowledge and take responsibility? Or do they deflect and find excuses? Because your response to what they say is obviously based on how they respond. If they try to hide behind the things you've already addressed, Simply point out that you've already addressed them. We've already acknowledged that. This keeps them engaged in the solution rather than looking for a way out of it. So for example, let's say that they say, I meant to get the report to you yesterday, but I had to go home. Plus we've had a lot of unexpected setbacks. At that point that you get to say something like, yes, I I know your kids are sick. And yes, there have been some emergencies that have come up and I wanna know what we can do to make sure that this still gets done. Ideally, at this point, you help them come up with their own solutions because they're the one who has to do it. People tend to have less resistance when it's their idea. For this one, there's obviously going to be some back and forth here as you discuss the situation and what to do. Once you've identified the solution, then action steps get to be taken. Then it's time for the final C, which is completion. And this is simply a recap of the ground that you've covered. 
any takeaways and any action items that you've identified. Okay, so what I hear you telling me is that you're going to block out an hour at the end of every Thursday to make sure that you have this report done for me by Friday morning. Is that correct? Great. I look forward to it. And that's the end of the conversation. And everyone lives happily ever after, right? Well, kind of. Yeah, it's the end of the conversation verbally, but the conversation actually continues through their behavior. Their behavior lets you know if they received the message or not. And once they've turned in the report or not, that's the next statement in the conversation. Then we get to respond to that. So let's go ahead and put all of this together. I know we're putting this out here piecemeal, but let's go ahead and take a moment and put all this together so you can see how it plays out in action. So I'm going to do all these pieces together, and I want you to see how many of the pieces you can pick out as we go. So we say something to the effect of, hey, thanks for taking the time to meet with me. And I want to check in with you on the project that you've been working on. But first, how's your kid? Are they feeling any better? Listen, I know you've got a lot going on right now. I know that your kid's sick and you've been dealing with that. And you've got a lot of fires to put out recently. And I want to talk to you about the project updates. I know we talked about it before. And you said you would get me an update every week. Obviously, that hasn't happened. The problem is that I can't keep the client informed if I don't know where we stand. And maybe part of the issue is that you're still waiting on information and you wanted to wait until you get a full update. But a partial update is way better than no update at all. So I want to find out, what do you need? What can I do for you to help to make sure that I have the update every week like we talked about? Could you hear them? Could you pick out the context? Could you pick out the, the conflict, the call to action? If so, that's awesome. That means you're starting to pick this stuff up. Well done. So that's the seven C's of a conversation. Number one, create the frame. Number two, establish the context. Number three, identify the conflict. Number four, provide the content. Number five, call the action. Six, check in, hear what they have to say. And number seven, completion with a wrap up and identifying the next steps and takeaways. And I know that's a lot to remember, especially if this is the first time hearing this or thinking about conversations at this level. So let's make it a little bit more bite-sized by streamlining these ideas. The seven C's are clearly the best way to go in terms of presenting your ideas in a conversation. But while you're learning this model, let's make it a simple, portable template. Let's streamline this whole thing into three C's. And I like to call this the basic formula. And that's simply context, conflict, and call to action. So for this shortened version, we're not setting things up as much as we would in doing the full process. We're not creating the open frame. We're not taking the time to identify the possible objections that exist and pre-handling them. This is just the meat of the conversation. Here's the context. Here's the conflict. And here's the call to action. It sounds something like this. Hey, I wanted to revisit our conversation on getting weekly updates. Clearly, I'm not getting them like we discussed. The problem is that I'm unable to do my job if I don't have that information. I need to get them every week. So what can we do differently to make sure that I get them? Could you hear the pieces there? Context. Let's talk about the updates. Clearly, I'm not getting them. Conflict. You're not doing your job, which means I can't do mine. That's a pretty clear conflict. And then call to action. How are we going to fix this? Very direct. Straight to the point, and it's a fine way to go. It's something you can use anywhere, anytime. One of the drawbacks, obviously, for this model is that because it doesn't pre-address the possible objections, the other person can still bring up those objections rather than responding to the specific call to action that you present. So creating the frame first, although it might seem like it's more work, can actually make it faster. It can make it a lot more efficient and more productive. Because then you spend your time on solving the problem rather than talking about why the problem exists in the first place, which are the objections or excuses. So let's review the basic formula and talk about how to put this to use. We start with the context, we describe the conflict, and then we make a call to action. If you can remember those three, you're in good shape and having positive, productive conversations. 
So now it's time to apply it. We already have established that conversations are the fundamental tool of leadership. We know that conversations are the main tool for improving performance, increasing sales, generating creativity, eliciting commitment, and creating results. So conversations can be used anywhere. What we want to do now is get clear on where they're most useful for you right now. What conversations have you been putting off? I want you to begin to think about this. What feedback have you not given? Is there someone who you haven't been holding accountable as much as you should? Is there a difficult conversation that you haven't had yet that you know you need to have? I want you to start to think about the conversations that are needed and that you can either have today or at least put on the schedule. Because once you put it on the schedule, then it's in motion. And as we said, an object in motion tends to stay in motion. That's what good conversations do. They create movement. They create momentum. Or they redirect existing momentum into a better direction. So as an exercise, as an assignment to start creating momentum or to get things back on track, create a list of all the people with whom you'd want to have a conversation with. Employees, bosses, vendors, customers, colleagues. It could even be personal. Family members, friends. For each person that you identify, write down a description of the conversation that you would want to have, and then prioritize that list of conversations. I know there's a tendency to start with the the first one on your list, but not all conversations are created equally. Pick the most important one, the most impactful conversation, and start there. Reach out to that person and have it as soon as you can to create momentum in that area. Of course, consider timing. Reaching out to your accountant on April 15th might not be the best timing. So, but consider the timing and have that conversation as soon as you can. As soon as you have that conversation, remember your mindset. You want to come into that conversation without an emotional charge. If you're charged up, they're going to pick up on that and reflect back to you that same charge. Then you'll get defensiveness and you won't make as much progress otherwise. So with the right mindset, then use the seven C's of conversation, which again are create the frame, context, conflict, content, call to action, check in, then completion. Or at least at the very least, the basic conversation formula, which is context, conflict, and call to action. And if you'd like, Send me a message and let me know how it goes. Email me at john at keyconvo.com. That's J-O-H-N at keyconvo.com. And tell me about your experience. Oh, and one quick comment before we wrap up our first conversation together as part of the Key Conversations for Leaders podcast. I want you to know that a lot of what we talked about is already installed inside of you. We've gone over the seven C's of conversation several times consciously and even subconsciously or unconsciously. In fact, our entire conversation today was also in the seven C's format. We've been going through this exact framework the entire time. We created the frame in which I said conversations are the most underutilized and underappreciated tools in our toolbox. We establish context. As leaders, we all want to get more results, more impact. Then I then we talked about the conflict. We rarely take the time to sharpen this tool, as important as it is. And then I gave you some content. And I said, we're going to be unpacking all the tools related to improving our leadership, including communication, accountability, responsibility. We talked a little bit about mindset. And then we went over the content, including the seven C's of conversations. Then we had a call to action. I suggested that you identify the conversations that you need to have right now. You pick the one that's most important and then put that conversation into motion. Then, because this is a podcast and not a real-time conversation, I jumped into completion. I summarized the content and the next steps, and then offered a check-in. I said, hey, send me an email and let me know how it goes. So change the order a little bit, but the seven C's were still there. So I wanted to structure this first podcast in this way to install this on multiple levels. As I said, consciously and unconsciously. 
Listen to this podcast as many times as you like to make this part of your everyday process. And also stay tuned for upcoming interviews and content right here at Key Conversations for Leaders. In fact, I'd love for you to help me shape this podcast. If you have a problem you'd like help with in your business, send me an email. Again, john at keyconvo.com because I want this show to be about what's important to you and your business and in your world. I look forward to hearing from you soon. So thank you so much for being here and listening to this, our very first podcast. And until next time, develop yourself, empower others, and lead by example. You've been listening to Key Conversations for Leaders with host John Ryan. For upcoming events and a bunch of free content, check out keyconvo.com. If you enjoyed, be sure to subscribe and share.